So I'd like to start off by focusing on the process of cell protrusion. As I mentioned, this is an early step in motility where the leading edge of the cell has to actually move forward out across the substrate. And because the cell is moving forward and is essentially exploring new territory, the process of cell protrusion cannot rely on any pre-assembled biological structures. In many cases, what we see is that the uh, protrusion of the leading edge of the cell is actually achieved by assembly of specifically actin filaments right underneath the plasma membrane at the leading edge of the cell. Um, and these can either be in forms of parallel meshworks, uh, uh, sorry, parallel bundles, or else of branch meshworks, pushing out the cell in slightly different geometries. The particular cell that you see here is one of those fish skin cells involved in wound healing, where we looked at the movie a little bit earlier. And this particular cell was moving upward at the time that it was fixed and stained. Here, the actin filaments within the cell have been visualized by labeling them with a mushroom toxin, phylloidin, which binds very tightly and very specifically to filamentous actin. And you can see in this moving cell, where the nucleus was actually down here at the bottom as the cell was moving upwards, the entire protrusive structure, which was pulling the cell across the substrate, is filled with a very dense network of these actin filaments. At this level of resolution in the light microscope, it's very hard to see individual actin filaments. But you can zoom in on this cell and look at, for example, structures that you would see right at the leading edge, right at this place where protrusion is happening to push out the new part of the cell forward. And what you see there is beautifully illustrated in this electron micrograph made by Tanya Svikina, where you see individual filaments throughout the cell, right up at the leading edge, that are organized in a branch network such that every filament is connected to every other filament. Each of these individual boxes in this image is then blown up at the bottom here, and you can see these branched structures where you have a single actin filament that then, um, <laughs> a single actin filament where then you have a, a branched daughter filament growing off of the side of it. Now, um, this kind of structure enables the properties of individual filaments essentially to be amplified, to be strengthened many thousand fold, because instead of having simply assembly properties of a single filament working to push the cell forward, you have assembly properties of all of these different filaments working in this very well organized way. So thinking about that, now looking at this image, what you can see is hundreds of different filaments that are all cross-linked together at the leading edge of the cell pushing its way forward. Now if you were to look at any one of those individual filaments, what you would see is that the filament itself is in turn made up of hundreds or thousands of subunits of individual actin proteins that self-assemble to make the filaments. So here again we see the um, actin monomer, and each one of these actin monomers has several other binding sites for actin on its surface where it can bind to a second copy of actin. Uh, for example, the top surface here can bind to the bottom surface another actin filament to create a string where everybody's lined up facing the same direction. When that happens repeatedly, what you end up is assembling a filament uh, that has a helical twist to it where uh, many, many individual copies of the, actin film, of the actin protein are aligned facing the same direction within the filament. Now, assembly of these uh, structures inside of cells actually has a lot of different layers of regulation, a lot of very interesting dynamics, which are absolutely critical to the rapid movement that I showed you in the movies before, and which, uh, to some extent, have been now understood the level of the behavior of individual proteins. When you think about these actin monomers coming together to make an actin filament, one thing that we've been able to determine as a field in in vitro using purified actin is that the hardest step in forming a filament is forming a nucleus. And in particular, you have to have a random accidental collision of three different individual copies of this actin protein coming together to make a nucleus that then can elongate into the filament. Once you've got that essential nucleus for growth, then elongation can occur very rapidly. Now, obviously, going from the size of a single protein, which is a few nanometers in size, to the size of these filaments, which can be several hundred different proteins all stuck together, is one step towards being able to make the large-scale structures necessary for cell motility and cell organization in general. However, it's not sufficient. And really, inside of cells, all of these different actin filaments are brought together or organized together by hundreds or thousands of actually distinct actin-binding proteins which are able to cross-link these filaments to each other, are able to direct the places where they're nucleated or the places where they disassemble, are able to change the dynamics of every aspect of their assembly and disassembly. And furthermore, as I believe you got the impression from looking at the movies, this is always a dynamic process. The filaments are always assembling and disassembling, and an individual filament typically doesn't stick around within a eukaryotic cell for longer than about a minute. 
Now the cells themselves obviously have to survive much longer than that. And in fact, for a cell to move forward in a persistent way over a long period of time, the cell itself has to be able to remember its polarity for much longer than the lifetime of any individual filament within it. And how these things, again, are coordinated over long times as well as long distances in space is, again, a very interesting and still open question in the field of cell biology. And I, I particularly want to emphasize uh, the importance of the dynamics of this process. And like pretty much everything else in biological systems, whenever you see anything happening very fast or turning over or very quickly, uh, that is something that requires energy. In the case of actin, remember the actin subunit actually binds to a nucleotide. That nucleotide can be ATP or ADP. And the nucleotide actually is hydrolyzed when the actin monomer uh, assembles into a filament. The consequences of that hydrolysis have very interesting outcomes with respect to the actin filament dynamics. In particular, a TP actin is more likely to polymerize, a DP actin is more likely to depolymerize. And therefore, by having the hydrolysis of the nucleotide, which is an energy releasing step associated with the assembly and disassembly of the filaments, the cell is able to burn energy to burn ATP in order to keep these filaments turning over very rapidly as it's going through its normal life processes. And as we'll see, it's those actual dynamics of the filaments that enable the cell to harness the energy associated with polymerization and depolymerization in order to produce productive forward movement. So how is it then that you take assembly and disassembly of these individual protein subunits, organize them into filaments, and then use that to actually generate force that can push the leading edge of the cell forward? Well, this is something that's been thought about in a lot of detail for more than 20 years. And there is a very useful thermodynamic summary of the issues involved in force generation by protein polymerization, published by Terrell Hill and Mark Kirshner in 1982. They took a very simple argument, which is essentially that we can think of the process of protein polymerization just as a simple binding reaction, where you have as the reactants in the binding reaction a filament and a subunit. And then the product of the binding reaction is a filament that's one subunit longer. And like any other binding reaction, there's going to be an on rate and an off rate, and there's going to be some equilibrium constant associated with this binding event. Now, imagine the situation inside of a cell, where because of the hydrolysis of ATP and various other sort of indirect processes, the cell always has a vast excess of monomers present. What that means in thermodynamic terms is that the reactants are always in excess, and therefore the forward reaction is always favored. Another way of saying that is that the free energy associated with polymerization, this binding reaction, the free energy of binding a monomer onto the end of the filament is always going to be negative. Associating a single monomer onto the end of the filament is always going to be an energetically favorable reaction that releases energy simply because the monomer is always present in excess. Now in biochemistry, whenever we have a particular kind of reaction which is energetically favorable, it is possible to couple that favorable reaction to a different reaction which is unfavorable and allow the favorable reaction to drive the unfavorable reaction forward. This is the way that all metabolic pathways, for example, are able to work. Now following on that idea, in the context of protein polymerization, now because the assembly of the protein is energetically favorable and releases a large amount of free energy, we can couple that free energy that's released to an unfavorable process and drive it forward. And in this case, instead of driving forward a biochemical reaction, what we're going to do is use that energy to drive forward a physical reaction, which is pushing a load. So down here in the corner, you can see a diagram where I'd like for you to imagine an individual actin filament, which is nailed down to a wall on its back end. And in its front end, its growing end, it's interacting with a load, which is represented by the small black rectangle. Now, because there's so many monomers present, the drive of the reaction, just mass action, is going to be for that monomer to add on to the end of the filament. But in order for the monomer to add on to the end of the filament, the load, the black rectangle, has to be able to move forward, to move one step forward. We can calculate how much energy it takes to move that load by knowing how hard it is to move it, what the force is that must uh, be exerted on that load through some distance. And as long as that force through a distance, or work, which is units of energy, is less than or equal to the amount of energy, free energy, that's released by the polymerization reaction, then the overall coupled reaction is favored, and the load will actually be able to move forward as long as the monomer has some mechanism for sneaking in between the end of the filament and that load. This essentially is the mechanism that allows cells to push those leading edges forward as they crawl across substrates. 
Now, the very interesting thing here is, although you can see that this is a reasonable reaction, it seems uh, unlikely that it should be able to actually generate a great deal of force. When you think about uh, molecular motors, such as kinesin or myosin, they take the very energetically favorable reaction of cleaving a nucleotide, cleaving ATP, in order to generate a conformational change that moves that protein along its filamentous track. Now, in this case, you're taking advantage only of this difference in free energy between the monomeric subunit and the subunit in the filament. So how much force can you really generate? Well, Terrell Hill worked through the thermodynamics of this problem, and he came up with this equation showing the maximum amount of force that can be generated by protein polymerization as a function of several different variables. K is Boltzmann constant, and T is the absolute temperature. The delta there is the size of the subunit, that is the distance that the uh, load has to move forward in order for a new subunit to be added to the filament. And the only other thing that uh, this process depends on is the ratio between the actual amount of uh, monomers that are present in solution, which is illustrated here as the letter C, and the equilibrium constant for polymerization, uh, which is also called the critical concentration, or C-crit. Now, C-crit for actin filaments is on the order of about one micromolar. And inside of cells, the concentration of actin is much, much higher than that. Again, there's always uh, excess monomer present. And if you take reasonable estimates for the amount of actin that's present inside of cells, and you just plug it into the equation, the number you come up with for the amount of force that can be generated by this very non-intuitive mechanism is on the order of about 5 to 10 piconewtons. And again, to put that in scale, that's almost exactly the same amount of energy that is, uh, or the same amount of force that's generated by a single molecule of myosin or a single molecule of kinesin when they cleave ATP in order to walk along a track. So this very non-intuitive form of force generation driven by protein polymerization is not just a motor, but in fact it's a very good motor, and it's just as good a motor as any of the more classical molecular motors that have been studied at the level of atomic detail. Now, this thermodynamic argument can tell us how much force can be generated by the assembly of an actin filament, but it can't tell us anything about how fast that's going to happen. And of course, for this force to be useful to a eukaryotic cell, it has to not just generate an appropriate amount of force, but it has to also generate in the right place, in the right time, and fast enough to be useful. And again, thinking back to that movie, The Neutrophil, you can see in order for that thing to crawl along, imagining how small the individual actin filaments are in the context of that enormous neutrophil cell, this obviously has to be happening with blazing speed. There have been several different kinds of physical models that people have suggested that can explain uh, the detailed process by which you can get an individual actin monomer to sneak in between the end of that elongating filament and the barrier that it's up against. So then with the, the strength of a detailed physical model in hand, we can then begin to predict how much time it's going to take and try to figure out if this is reasonable or not. And what I've illustrated here are two different examples of the kinds of physical models that people have proposed that will help us predict how fast these motors can actually go. In the first one, the idea is essentially that you have the actin monomer fixed in space, and then the load is able to undergo thermal fluctuations in position just through Brownian motion. Now, when the load moves slightly away from the actin filament, it's possible for a monomer to sneak in between the end of the load and the filament, and thereby essentially ratchet the Brownian motion of the load to be one step further forward. That's one possibility. Another possibility is there can be other kinds of thermal motion in the system which can be exploited by the process of protein polymerization in order to give directional movement. And another possibility is illustrated here uh, on the other side where you can see the actin filaments, for example, fluctuating because, again, of thermal motion in time. And as they bend away from the surface, if they bend far enough away that an individual monomer can sneak in, then that will essentially uh, generate a stress where the uh, filament is bent and is pushing on the load and can then push it forward. And these types of mechanisms, since we know some information about how rapidly all the different elements in the system are able to move by thermal motion, can actually give realistic predictions of how fast this should happen. And several different kinds of calculations have suggested that force generation by this protein polymerization mechanism should be able to produce forward motion to the leading edge of the cell at very rapid rates, on the order of one micron per second, which is as fast as the fastest cells are actually able to crawl. So again, it's a non-intuitive motor, but it generates a lot of force, and it does it, in fact, very quickly.